The reading from the book of the prophet Jeremiah today is one of those readings that we all probably have had a moment when we could identify with it, when it's a reading that we could maybe, in, especially in some time of suffering or pain or loss or something like that, that we could easily identify with. The prophet Jeremiah it speaks to the church in Judea uh, at the time of just preceding and at the time of the fall of Jerusalem and the exile. They'll be taken off into exile shortly. Jeremiah, probably more than any of the other Old Testament prophets, suffered terribly for being a prophet. Like many of the prophets, he didn't want to do it in the beginning anyway. He even told the Lord that he was too young, uh, that he didn't know how to speak and all that. And God said, I'm going to tell you what to say. You go say it. And of course, he took the, the mantle of a prophet and he went and he did it. But oh my, the price he paid was incredible. He wasn't martyred, but you could probably call him a martyr in the Old Testament to the Word of God because he certainly died much earlier than he should have died because of the terrible, even physical afflictions that the people put on him, especially the princes and the, the royal folks. He spent a lot of time in their face. You duped me, O oh Lord, and I let myself be duped. You fooled me, God. You fooled me, and I let myself be fooled by you. All the day, I'm an object of laughter, mocking. Whenever I speak, I must cry out. The word of the Lord has brought me derision and reproach all day long. I even say to myself, he says, in this little prayer to the Lord, I will not mention God anymore. I will not mention God anymore. I will speak in his name no more. But it's like a fire burning in my heart, he says. It's a passion for Jeremiah. It, it, the very word in him is he is passionate about having to speak it becomes like fire burning in my heart, imprisoned in my bones. I grow weary holding it in. I cannot endure it. I think probably in our lives we've had moments where we've maybe not used his words, you fooled me, God. Uh, but I think we have those moments when we really truly do suffer and wonder where God is, especially in the suffering. It's that age-old question, why is there suffering in the world if God is so good? That countless, there have been countless attempts to answer it, and all of them are, are futile. It, Jesus never answered the question. He embraced the suffering. He took it on and said there's something beyond it. He never once duped. He never once fooled or attempted to fool his disciple, his, his disciples. Up front, always with his message. In the gospel for today. He begins to show his 
disciples, there's three of these that are coming. This is the first, that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer greatly. Not enter in triumph, not, oh boy, it's all the wonderful role of a Messiah is going to begin. Suffer greatly. Be killed. And on the third day be raised. And Peter, God loving, they leave Peter so much like us in the Gospels, and it's so great, because he truly is our brother, and he truly is somebody that we can identify with in the Scriptures. God forbid, Lord! No suffering. Oh, well, isn't going to go that way. Well, that's not the way. That's not the way to be a Messiah. You know, don't say those kinds of things. You're really going to discourage people from following you. Not like that. We got to restore the kingdom. We got to build this great world out here. It can't have suffering in it. You got to take all this stuff away. You have to restore the kingdom of David like it used to be. In one of, the, one of the rare occasions in the sacred scriptures, Jesus turns on somebody. Does it a couple times. And it's usually when there's gross misunderstanding of what he's telling them how it's going to be. Get behind me, Satan. The last time Satan in the Gospels tried to divert Jesus from the suffering and cross that were coming. The last time was in the desert, right after his baptism. Satan comes and tries three times to turn him away from his mission. That's why Jesus calls him Satan, because he's trying to turn Jesus away from his mission. The mission given him by his father, the promise of suffering, but of something beyond it yet, too. You are an obstacle to me. You're stopping me from coming deeper into your life, into your heart, Peter, into into your soul. You're blocking me. Don't block me. It's interesting because in the literal Greek of the New Testament, get behind me reads, get in my footsteps. Wow. That's the literal meaning of the Greek words that are used there. Get behind me. Get in my footsteps. Where I walk, you will walk. If you're my disciple, I'm the master, I'm the Lord. I'm going this way. And you too must embrace suffering and misunderstanding and difficulty. And, and I, your Lord and master, am going to do this. And so will you in your following of me. The big difference, of course, between the Old and the New Testament is life eternal. And God's very strong presence with us even in the midst of our suffering. We don't need a Simon of Cyrene. We have a Lord who is our Simon of Cyrene, helping us to carry the cross we already have. 
It's here. It's part of us. And Jesus even says, you're not thinking like God thinks, Peter. You're, you're thinking like human beings do. Why, why all this suffering? Well, how's come all this suffering's here? How's come, why doesn't God just take all this away? Why doesn't God just remove all of it? We'll all be la-la. I guess we'll all live in la-la land all the time. Everything, always sunshine, always bright, always smiling, always happy. Get a life. Jesus entered our world, my dear brothers and sisters. He entered this world and took our life on. And he said to us that suffering is redemptive. We can make suffering a prayer. We can turn Suffering, even here on this earth, is something very life-giving. We don't hear about that a lot anymore, but that's part of being Catholic. We embrace the cross. We're called to embrace the suffering. I can remember my mother lying in her hospital bed way back in 1963, suffering greatly with cancer. And this is before palliative, the way palliative medicine has moved on as it has now. And she would actually roll the sheets. The pain was so bad. And I would say to her, because they did have morphine at the time, and I would say to her, Mom, can I can I call the, call the nurse and, and see if, it, if she can give you a shot? And there were times when she would say, yes, go ahead. But more times than not, she would say, no, not yet. I'm offering this for your father for you kids, for the poor souls in purgatory. I'm offering this for one of her sisters, one of her families, our extended families. She had this way of giving suffering a purpose, an, I an identity far braver than I am, believe me. Suffering is redemptive. He won redemption for us through suffering. And you know what he asks? He asks but one thing of a disciple. Get in my footsteps. 